Shalom, hello again. Uh, welcome back to our Tell It on the Mountain series. Well, we've been to Mount Moriah where we started with the Abrahamic Covenant, that uh, dramatic moment where God gave the land of Israel to the Jewish people. Um, <laughs> that's uh, under so much discussion these days. He gave it all, including uh, uh, Jericho and the West Bank and so on, to uh, Abraham and to his seed forever. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, right on down through the Jewish patriarchs and on to the uh, people of Israel. No question about the ownership of the land, although possession of the land can be in question according to Jewish obedience to God. That is between uh, the Israelis and God. But uh, ownership of the land is not in question. That's, uh, that was given in the Abrahamic covenant. And we went to Mount Moriah where Abraham offered Isaac in sacrifice to uh, show that program. We went to Mount Sinai in Egypt to, to talk about the law and to Gamla in Galilee about history and wisdom, Gamla, Masada, and, and the Holocaust we dealt with. Uh, for the subject of prophecy, we went to Mount Tabor and to talk about the Messiah to the Mount of Beatitudes. Uh, we talked about grace at Golgotha, uh, Calvary, where he was crucified. And uh, tonight we're going to deal with the church on Mount Zion. Uh, in upcoming programs, we'll treat the kingdom on the Mount of Olives, and we'll have the music program uh, featuring all of our music for the series, along with uh, beautiful footage of the Holy Land to end the series. Well, tonight, uh, the church. We're going to go to Mount Zion. It lies southwest of the Temple Mount and Mount Moriah on the edge of the old city of Jerusalem. We'll be joined later in the program by our correspondent, David Dolan, with some up-to-date uh, notes of what's happening on these sites. And now to location. Well, we're uh, on the summit of Mount Zion this morning. It doesn't look exactly like a mountain because, of course, it's uh, covered with buildings. And there are some famous buildings here. Most notably, uh, behind me and there is King David's tomb, where the sepulcher of David, uh, as, as Peter said in Acts 2, David lies buried in his sepulcher is with us to this day. It, this is the traditional site of that tomb. There is a sepulcher in there. and. Uh, Upstairs, the upper room. It's a famous uh, uh, building containing a, a great deal of religion, a great deal of faith. And of course, uh, Mount Zion itself is, is uh, throughout the scriptures very, very important. The whole concept of Zion, Zion meaning the promised land, Zion is sometimes used as the name of heaven. Romans 11:26, all Israel will be saved when the deliverer shall come out of Zion. Uh, or uh, to mean the holy city, the uh, city of Zion, uh, the holy mountain of the Lord, Mount Zion. I could quote uh, Joel 2.32, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Uh, salvation on this mountain in Jerusalem and in the remnant of believers that are always found in every generation. Well, the, uh, the building that we will enter that contains the upper room and David's tomb is a fascinating one, thought to be the first messianic assembly. If you have a messianic congregation in your town, you know what I mean, Jewish believers in Jesus and Gentiles join with them and uh, have, uh, in effect, a church. But this building, if it was a messianic assembly, would have been the first church in the world. And in a past program, we interviewed, if you remember, an archaeologist who was a Catholic priest who had very carefully researched uh, this building and its archaeology and, and uh, its construction underground and found uh, some fascinating clues to that. So as people believed in Jesus, they wanted to meet together and worship together, and your theory is they came here uh, to this place. Yes, they did come here because this was the center of uh, the first community. Jesus had the Last Supper here. Here they gathered uh, when the Holy Spirit came down upon them. Here they gathered again for the first Council of Jerusalem, the Council of the Apostles. And here uh, they came back after they had fled to Pella in the year uh, 67, they came back again in the year 73 after Christ and built up again in the, in the next decade this, uh, this synagogue. 
The first Messianic synagogue, Pixner believes, was here in what is now traditionally called the Tomb of David. Most archaeologists concur that King David was probably buried in the nearby city of David. The floor of this site, Pixner suggests, offers the first clues. Recent excavations reveal floors from other periods, including Crusader, Byzantine, and Roman periods. Surprisingly, Judeo-Christian graffiti was found on the earliest floor. The graffiti was translated by a team of expert Bible scholars who found phrases that included, O oh Jesus, that I may live, and conquer, savior, mercy. Father Pixner went on to explain further why he believes this tomb site was actually the Church of the Apostles. And behind the, there, there is a niche, and this niche goes back to the first structure, which really is the niche which points the direction of prayer. On that niche, the Judeo-Christians had put the Torah scrolls, maybe also part of their Gospels. And it points very interestingly, not no more to the temple as usually synagogues do, but to the place of the resurrection, to the, to the Holy Sepulchre. Still, a third clue that the apostles first met here on Mount Zion may be found in the building stones. Temple stones were used up here, and we are, I don't know, a mile from the temple site or more. Uh, it's not easy to carry these stones, and people brought from the wrecked temple site around the western wall have always been stones in the southern wall of, of past uh, temple destruction. Somebody brought stones all the way up this hill uh, to build this building out of stones that were, in other words, already consecrated, holy stones, stones originally quarried to build the temple of God. So since the uh, building is partially built of temple stone and since it was made to face Calvary, it is thought that this messianic assembly was really a church uh, and, and therefore the first church. And that is our subject on tonight's program, the church. By definition, it is the Jews and Gentiles who believe in Jesus Christ from Pentecost to the rapture. Uh, we, we confuse it when we say it's the building, uh, you know, the church on the corner. It's really the called out group. It's the people in the building, of course. Uh, and we have two kinds of churches uh, in the uh, New Testament, the, uh, the uh, local church and the universal church. The local church is the one we're familiar with as the building on the corner, the First Baptist or the First Methodist or whatever churches in your town uh, that you regard as a local church. But the universal church is all the believers of the world uh, gathered uh, together to worship. And uh, they actually haven't had their first meeting yet. That would actually be in that great day when he comes. The universal church has really never had a meeting. And that's all the believers. And it will meet. Its first meeting is at the rapture of the church. When the Lord comes and the people uh, of all generations of the church, uh, they come out of the ground, they, uh, they come out of the churches today, they come out of their homes in the rapture, and that will be the first service of the universal church. You know, when our tour groups uh, travel in the Middle East, we go to sites of famous churches. Once at Ephesus, I was asked, uh, uh, you know, because Ephesus has ancient buildings that are restored and re-excavated, then uh, you have a library and you have uh, this building and that building and so on that the people can see. So inevitably somebody says, well, where's the church? I've read about the church in Ephesus. Which building was the church? Well, they didn't have uh, church buildings then. They met in people's homes as, as Messianic congregations do here in Jerusalem and sometimes in America as well uh, in the first century. So there was no building to point at, but I did think of an answer which was, gee, if we stand here long enough, we'll see them. They'll, they'll come right out of the ground. The dead in Christ rise first. When we return, we'll visit another important room in this building on Mount Zion, the upper room. Israel, it's a once in a lifetime experience. In a word, it's terrific, compelling, wonderful. Breathtaking. This is not one word, okay? Super. <laughs> Delightful. Phenomenal. Probably indescribable. No, oh, you can't do it in one word. Peaceful. Peaceful. Beautiful. If you're Christian, come. Well, this is the famous upper room. 
It's decorated in various styles, crusader arches, uh, Muslim niches of marble, uh, Corinthian columns, everybody's idea of how it ought to look. But uh, the site itself is, is fairly authentic. We call it a traditional site, which means nobody wrote down exactly what house and what room. But then again, the believers told each other generation to generation that this was the place. In that first meeting of the Universal Church, when the Lord comes to take us out of here, uh, we'll learn the truth whether this was in fact the room where the first church met. And why not? The room of the Last Supper, the room where he pronounced uh, the fact that he would go to prepare a place for us and then come back and take us there that we may be where he is. He is the head of the church. He is the first love of the church. That's very important. He uh, stressed that, uh, lovest thou me to Peter. Uh, he is present with us. We are the indwelling place of the Holy Spirit. All those things true of the church. Uh, he's engaged to us. In uh, 2 Corinthians 11, the way it's put is, uh, I espouse you to uh, the Lord, a chaste and holy bride. Uh, he actually, in this room, presented the contract and drank the cup that is part of the Jewish wedding ceremony, and we've told this in many contexts. Uh, the contract is, is uh, well, in shortest form, his statement when he drank the cup, this is the, uh, my blood uh, shed for the many for remission of sins. And the cup itself is, is, when he served it to his disciples, is in effect the bridal cup. The church lifted it up. Our representatives, the disciples, drank it. And so when he comes back, he'll stop for them and for us. Uh, he paid the price up the hill on Calvary. And uh, when he comes back, like the bridegroom comes coming for the bride in the middle of the night, like that thief in the night, he'll shout with a great shout. It says in the parable of the ten virgins, it was midnight and a cry was made, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Or 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout. And that will be the opening cry of the universal church. That will be its first meeting in the air with the Lord. And then we'll uh, go on into heaven through the judgment seat of Christ and the wedding feast uh, and back to earth where we will set up our kingdom, which really is the ultimate church. The thousand year kingdom is a great big church. That is its whole population. And its whole reason for being is that at last we have the church in full, not the church in part or the kingdom in part. We have the real thing. Uh, we will directly worship the king. That is not an invisible Lord, but uh, one we can see. That is clear in Zechariah 14. Uh, it, uh, when he returns, it says, And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all those nations which came up against Jerusalem shall even come up from year to year to worship the Lord and to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And the following verses talk about each country of the world. They must come and uh, celebrate tabernacles. That's why there's so many pilgrims here on the Feast of Tabernacles, because we're going to be doing this for a thousand years to come. They're sort of getting the habit, getting in practice. If we're going to come here and worship the Lord in, in person, then this is, this is the great church. This is the, the great meeting of the universal church. And so it will go on. Uh, direct worship of the king in Jerusalem. The upper room was the place where he established the church in its most important way. That is to say, uh, he's going away and coming back. It, it's what makes it differ from all worldly religions. Uh, Mohammed is really not scheduled to reappear, nor Buddha, nor the false Christs, uh, uh, of which we have so many these days. Uh, but the real Christ said, I go to prepare a place for you. I come back, I'll take you there so you can be where I am. It's, it's the thing that the bridegroom said when he departed after the bride drank the cup. It's the thing that uh, uh, gives us the assurance of our salvation. He cannot have paid such a price and then never returned for us. And we are all he gets for dying on the cross. And you know how high a price it was to him because in, uh, in, in Luke 22, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he wept as it were drops of blood falling to the ground said to his father, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. 
And it was here he established that he's the only way. He said, uh, uh, you know where I go and you know the way. And gosh, Peter, uh, Thomas, Philip were here, the doubters, uh, the questioners. Uh, was it Thomas who said, uh, but Lord, how can we know the way? And, uh, uh, we don't know the way. And, and he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He established here the principle that we are the church in waiting, engaged, espoused, waiting to be reclaimed. In that Jewish wedding story, the bride waits at home every night for the groom while the groom is away preparing a place for her, building a mansion, a, a bridal chamber for their honeymoon. The Lord said in, in this room, in my Father's house are many mansions. And then I go to prepare a place for you. In this room, he promised us the Comforter, who we now have, the indwelling Holy Spirit. He said, I'll, I won't leave you alone. I'll send you the Comforter. And they waited here. They waited here as he commanded for Pentecost. And on that great Pentecost day, when the feast was fully come in Acts 2, they must have gotten up and gone down to the temple site and there the Holy Spirit came, and 3,000 were saved. And, and it's, it's not a haphazard number because we remember from the law, Exodus 32, 28, when uh, Moses came down from the mount, the people were, were worshiping a golden calf, and the Levites, with the blessings of God, went through the crowd slaying these idol worshipers. And how many did they kill? But 3,000. God is a good bookkeeper. Uh, he took 3,000, then he returned 3,000 on that Pentecost morning. The letter kills, the Spirit gives life. And so pilgrims keep on coming. You can hear them coming, you can hear them singing uh, constantly, constantly since the first century to, to just be in that room, that place where he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. That day Philip said to him, Show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Imagine, uh, show us what Job never saw, Abraham or Noah or, or, or King Solomon in all his glory. Show us Almighty God, and we'll believe you. And the Lord said, if you've seen me, you've seen him. We're well to remember that. It's been nearly 2,000 years since the disciples gathered here with our Lord on Mount Zion. Well, what's happened since? David Dolan, our journalist friend, joins us now with his up-to-date perspective on the church in Israel today. The body of Messiah is a tiny minority of the over six million people who live in modern-day Israel. There are around 100,000 Arab Christians. Most belong to ancient churches like the Greek Orthodox Church. There are just 2,000 evangelicals. Jewish believers also number around 2,000. They meet in some 36 congregations around the country. A few, like here at Christ Church on Mount Zion in the Old City, have over 100 members. But most are much smaller, like in the early days of the church. There are also several Russian-speaking congregations, mostly made up of new immigrants from the former Soviet Union. And there are hundreds of foreign believers, mostly from North America and Europe. And they often attend messianic fellowships like this one. The body of Messiah in Israel is very small, but vibrant. Like the modern Jewish state, it is growing in numbers, awaiting the return of the Messiah, Yeshua. And in the meantime, we can all pray for the peace of Jerusalem.
Never are we apart. Uh, God reminds us all of, of, of the idea that he is always listening. The song, Hear Me, tells of a common Christian experience that even the king had. Uh, we, we all experience this idea of being tired and troubled, which, which the song says it, and wondering, does God hear? And we all cry out to him, but he invariably answers, I hear you. In Luke 4 is the story of... of uh, the temptation of Christ. Uh, Jesus went to the Mount of Temptation next to Jericho. Uh, we've been there many times. And uh, there he was tempted of the devil. He was hungry and the devil uh, uh, you know, offered him bread and he showed him the kingdoms of the world, offered him power and so on. The Lord quoted scripture each time, ultimately ending up instructing Satan, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. It's about that simple. And uh, th that, was, that was tense and full of strife, and uh, it is a site of tension and strife still today. Uh, quiet little Jericho, a place uh, uh, our tourists have always gone to and, and uh, is, is a pleasant, re oh, uh, a kind of a regenerating feeling to drive there because you go through a wilderness and then you come into this pretty little town of, of palm trees and, and fruit hanging off the trees and, and plenty of water running up and down the gutters. We stopped the bus by a grand old sycamore tree uh, that's been there for, for so long and, and uh, there's a sycamore tree in the gospel. Some, some say it's the same tree and we read from uh, Luke 19 about the Zacchaeus, you know, climbing this tree to, to see the Lord and the Lord calling him down and saying, I'll, I'll sup with you at your house tonight and uh, establishing uh, the biblical principle of restitution. He'll pay back four times what uh, uh, what he might have taken from the people as the tax collector and so on. Any cheating he did, he was so impressed. Uh, <laughs> it's a place of, 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 of discussion and turmoil, and uh, I don't have to tell you, it, it still is. This is the world's oldest inhabited city. It, it's a good one for a Bible quiz or, or any other kind of quiz. People first lived at Jericho and still live there. I don't say first lived there, but I mean of cities inhabited today. It has the longest history. There is a tower in the ground there which you can see. Uh, dug out around and you look down on these stones and it's been carbon dated as having been built 9,500 years ago. And it's not just a, a, a rudimentary tower, it's a beautiful building. If it were built today in a city park, people would love to see it. Um, the Prince of Peace knows the spot. He was there and uh, we know the spot and I only hope as, as we go into a period of uncertainty about Jericho, that it will always remain a place of peace and promise. This is where God selected to show his promised land to his chosen people after they were 40 years in the wilderness. Uh, the results of the battle for Jericho were clear. The Israelis won. Uh, the Jewish people won the city in that battle. Uh, we'll see what happens today. 
Uh, our offer has to do with uh, Scripture, of course, and uh, this time the Bible, the whole story, the, the, the notebook, uh, systematic theology on which this entire series is based. We went from mountaintop to mountaintop, uh, teaching oh, uh, the law, grace, prophecy, the church, etc. And each of these is a chapter in this notebook and uh, uh, a theology that I wrote uh, years ago at a time when I I thought maybe I had better write my uh, uh, what ideas I had about the Bible down in case that was the last chance to write them. Uh, thanks for your prayers. It wasn't, and uh, the book is, is available. Uh, we've updated it. We've put pictures of the mountains in it so that it will be reminiscent of this series and a new introduction and so on. It's uh, $29, and I think a theology that you will value and enjoy reading. And, of course, it supports the program. We will offer also the... Uh, uh, tell it on the mountains music the entire series uh, songs and more some you haven't heard uh, $12 for the audio cassette another one of our tapes and uh, uh, which you've always liked uh, remember the funds folks that's how we really make these programs not so much by mailing you something but by using the funds to pay for the next series so a gift if you please and shalom Yerushalayim pray for the peace of Jerusalem